All right, students, welcome back to Lecture 13, Introduction to Homer's Odyssey, books 18 and 19, slides 246 to 277. Today, let's remember where we were. Odysseus, in the form of Arnaeus the beggar, had just found another beggar at the threshold to his own home. And the suitors had set up sort of a gleeful, terrible, ignoble combat between these two beggars, uh, during which Odysseus had a chance to show off his big thighs and shoulders, which caused uh, great fear and shivering in... Uh, poor Eros, also called Arnaios. Eros, of course, because uh, he is named for Iris, the messenger goddess, because he sends messages between the suitors. But that is the, uh, the male form of the name rather than the female form that Iris has. In any case, Odysseus had a chance to fight against him, slugged him in the jaw where the neck meets the jawbone, seems to have broken his jaw. Blood is, uh, he's drooling blood, Eros is, and he gets dragged outside. And that's where we pick up today. Odysseus takes... Eros outside and leaves him there, warning him not to try to be king of the strangers and beggars. There's only one king around, and that king is Odysseus, and he's taking back what's his even from the beggars. The suitors then toast him, and I always think that this is a fantastic bit, because what is it that they say in his toast? They wish him well, they wish him to receive something, but what is it that they wish him to have? They say, May the gods grant you whatever you want most of all. Well, that's sort of a funny thing to wish to uh, Odysseus here, because what he wants most of all is to kill them and to end their lives, and thus their occupation of his home and their poor treatment of his serving women, his wife, his son, who they're actually attempting to kill, um, and his land itself. Even his swineherd is, to some extent, being mistreated by having to work more to uh, help these uh these insolent enemies, you might say, these, uh, these interlopers. I think that's actually a pretty good word for them, interlopers. In any case, the suitors unknowingly toast to their own destruction. May you have whatever you wish. And Odysseus thinks, I certainly will be having that very soon at your expense. So, Amphinomus, he then wishes Odysseus health. And Amphinomus is a very interesting character in, uh, in this part of the story for se several reasons. Um, before I get into exactly what happens here, there are maybe two or three things I should say about Amphinomus. Amphinomus is the one uh, seemingly kind suitor. He seems to be sort of genteel. He seems to know something of the Zinnia, though obviously as a suitor, he is not honoring the Zinnia quite correctly. There is a story outside of Homer that Penelope, uh, there are two stories about Penelope that suggest that she was not perfectly chaste, that she did cheat. Uh, once or twice. There are two separate stories. And in one of those stories, it is with Eurymachus that she cheats. But in another, it is Amphinomus. Perhaps precisely because he is so kind. Something interesting, though, about him is that you notice this language here. Uh, Odysseus gives him a speech and talks about the helplessness of man and says, There is nothing more helpless in all the world than man. In lines uh, 125 to one. 50. And uh, from the descriptions we've heard of how, uh, or, or of Odysseus's lying descriptions of where he's been from Crete and uh, subject to storms, and the stories that we heard in the Iliad of Heracles being subject to storms, and the times we've seen people subject to storms. Uh, remember that um, uh, it was precisely in a storm that Aias the Lesser died. It was in a storm that Menelaus was sent off to Egypt, which kept him from being able to help his father Agamemnon. And then even uh, remember that Eumaeus, as a young person, not involving a storm here, but was stolen away by a, uh, a servant woman. People, people are not in full control of their lives. And perhaps even you uh, interpret Helen in that way. Perhaps you, you uh, do not blame her for the Trojan War because perhaps it was Aphrodite that made her love. Perhaps it was uh, um, Paris that forced her uh, to leave with him. Not usually how the story goes. But perhaps, in any case, it does seem like man is not all powerful in any way. That we are all subject to many different things. The environment we find ourselves in, the people around us, the things that happen, mostly, we do not make happen. And uh, this will be a good example of that, because Amphinomus hears this. And um, Odysseus counsels him, you probably shouldn't stay around here. And yet, the language, as I said, is very interesting. Athena finds him. If you are an Old Testament scholar, you've ever read the old story of uh, Moses, let my people go to Pharaoh. There's very similar language, though, of course, in Hebrew, not in ancient Greek, where it says that uh, God twice hardens the heart 
of Pharaoh. And how to interpret that, I think, is a very interesting question. Is it the fact that Athena literally makes it so that this man cannot choose, uh, cannot make a better choice? Or, or is this uh, sort of uh, a symbol, like he is making an unwise choice, and therefore he is acting against uh, what Athena would have him do if he were doing the most intelligent possible thing. In any case, he will be the first person who gets killed by Telemachus as he charges towards Odysseus. He will get a spear in the back. And so I guess there are many things that he does not see coming at him. In any case, there's another picture of Odysseus crushing Eros. Again, big thigh. Uh, that's what he's known for, at least according to uh, Eros. And then we have something happen that has not uh, happened before, supposedly. We have seen Penelope address the suitors, but she decides to publicly address the suitors of her own volition. Not because, well... It's hard to say exactly why, uh, uh, unless we read it right here. So let's do that. But now the goddess, gray-eyed Athena, put in the mind of da the daughter of Icarus, circumspect Penelope, to show herself to the suitors, so that she might all the more open their hearts, and so that she might seem all the more precious in the eyes of her husband and son, even than she had been before this. So Athena puts an idea in her head, that she wants to go down looking very elegant in front of the suitors so that they uh, uh, desire her even more and will give her more gifts. And it will just so happen to be the fact that Telemachus will be down there and her husband, though she doesn't know it, which perhaps will motivate her husband to fight even harder because he's like, whoa, my wife is rather fetching, rather beautiful. I could kill 108 suitors for her. So Penelope comes down. Uh, before uh, she comes down, however, uh, remember what she's doing most of the time. She, most of the time, she's not weaving. She's in a room, and she's weeping. And when you weep, if you happen to be somebody who paints your face or wears makeup, your makeup gets everywhere. And then you're sort of a mess. And so her uh, attending lady, your enemy, uh, says, uh, you could go down and see the suitors, but you should probably take a bath first. And uh, we recall that this is a major motif throughout the Odyssey. When you want to present yourself to people, you want to present your best self to people, and so often after you have cleaned yourself up, you look your best. Recall that this was literally the case with Odysseus in front of Nausicaa. He came out of a bush after living on, uh, or living on the ocean for about 20 days and looked like a wild uh, monster man that made people, made young women literally run away from him and scream uh, in terror. But after a bath, all of a sudden he's taller, thicker, curlier in his hair. And uh, Nasca even thought of him as a potential mate, as a potential husband. And so there's a great interplay here between our perceptions. Sometimes Odysseus looks like a monster. Sometimes Odysseus looks like a beggar. Sometimes he can be very beautiful. It seems to be similar with Penelope. There's a time and a place to look in a certain way. In any case, Athena then puts her to sleep for a small time, makes her taller, thicker, and paler, not curlier here. Of course, this was the idea back then that... Um, the paler you were, the less you had to work outside, the nobler you were in terms of blood and rank. Uh, this is why Hera is described as Hera of the white arms. White armed Hera. The suitor's knees buckle when she descends with desire for Penelope. I can only imagine. I mean, this is very much like one of those high school movies where like, there's a young lady and maybe she's got a lot to her, but she hasn't normally dressed really well or done the makeup thing. And then she meets a friend and they do a makeover. And then she's coming down the stairs for the first time and the guy that she likes who's never paid attention to her is like, whoa, who's that? She like touches her hair. She's moving in slow motion. And she's like, ah, ha, 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 ha. And the guys are like, what? Is that Becky? Or something like that. In any case, the suitor's knees buckle with desire for Penelope. The stratagem works. Quick review. We don't really need that. In any case, Odysseus then goes to Telemachus and says, you need to store away the weapons from the Great Hall where the suitors corrupt. Why? Well, uh, they're about to use the Great Hall as a slaughtering room. They're going to bar both the doors, and Odysseus is going to get access to a weapon. It will be a bow and arrow, and then they're going to uh, fortify a position at one end of the Great Hall, and they're going to rain uh, uh, Hades onto those, those men who are defenseless, armless. Uh, so, what Telemachus needs to do to make sure that this actually happens, because several 
pieces need to uh, be moved correctly is he needs to get the weapons that are on the walls of the Great Hall, things like spears, shields, swords, off the walls of the Great Hall. And he has to come up with a pretense for this. Obviously, he can't be honest. He can't say, I need to move. Uh, the when the suitors see him taking the weapons off the wall, they'll probably say, why? Why are you doing this? And he can't say, well, because we're soon going to attempt to kill you and we don't even have any weapons. So that's a lie. And uh, we haven't seen Telemachus put forward a lot of lies yet. We've seen Odysseus, and we've seen Telemachus compared to Odysseus favorably by both Nestor and Menelaus and even by uh, Helen. But here's his first chance to really act like his father. And, well, you know, he has in several other ways, too. He showed an adventurous temperament. He went to Pylos, and he went to Sparta. He showed that he uh, understood the Xenia, even when he went by Pylos. He knew that he was doing something that would upset somebody, but he knew that he had something more important to do, which was to save his home. We've seen him endure the insults that his father has been uh, having to endure. Uh, he has not stepped up and defended his father, even though he has said, you know, if you suitors continue to act in this way or harm him, I will uh, run you through with a spear. In any case, um, Telemachus says, well, there are a couple reasons why I'm going to move these weapons. One is this, the smoke from the fires. It's starting to, it's starting to dull the blades. They're getting unclean, and uh, we want to keep them nice and pristine. Second reason is, you guys, you drink a lot. And when you drink, sometimes you get into conflicts. If you get into a conflict, you might want to grab a weapon. Then you might do something unthinkable, like stab your friend, just because you got upset at them and were drunk. We have seen that sort of thing happen. Uh, Polyphemus got drunk, lost an eye. Um, Elpenor got drunk, lost his life, broke his neck. And so uh, there is some reasonableness behind what uh, Telemachus is saying. In any case, the, uh, the suitors accept his story. And some divinity, he says, might make you fight with them while drinking wine. And so then the second part of the strategy goes into effect. First, we have to get rid of the weapons of the suitors. Second, we have to trap them. And so who does he trust to make sure that the doors get barred on both sides? He trusts Eurycleia, the most trustworthy of the serving maids. And so, he says, you need to keep the women inside the house, but away from uh, the Great Hall, no matter what you hear. And what they'll be hearing are things like, Oh my, Zeus! My arm! Oh! My spleen! Oh! Ah! And she's just supposed to be like, Oh, they're just having a good time in there. Don't worry about it. This is, uh, uh, this is what they do, I suppose. In any case, he also says something very interesting. You recall our, our theme of buildings, Roman, of, Going from being, or character development, of going from being a boy to a man. And we've been talking about whether Telemachus is an adult yet, or still a kid. Well, when he commands Eurycleia to keep the serving women out of the great hall and in the house, and to bar the doors, he says, I was a child before. Which suggests that he is now a man, or a reptile man. Probably a man, though, because there's no evidence in the text that he's a reptile. All right, your Cleo obeys, bars the doors, and then Odysseus and Telemachus hide the weapons. And while they're doing this kind of an interesting thing, uh, some light appears out of nowhere. Athena illuminates their way. And Telemachus actually brings this up to Odysseus. He's like, what's going on here? Is this some trick of the gods? And Odysseus essentially says, shh. Uh, he hushes him and says, do not ask questions, for this is the very way of the gods. He says, don't worry, you know, if something's going well for us right now, don't ask questions, just accept it and keep moving. Because... Obviously, uh, Odysseus knows that if they're going to defeat the suitors, they're going to need the help of Athena, which she has actually promised to him. So, it's time for Telemachus to go to bed. But it is not yet time for Odysseus to go to bed, because remember, he set up a date tonight. He is supposed to go see Penelope, or rather, she's going to come see him. And, uh, well, let's get there. Penelope descends the stairs. I just want you to take a second. Don't even write for three seconds. And just imagine the person you have been waiting to see for about 20 years. You've, she, you've already seen her once, but now she's coming to see you. She looks at you. Maybe he looks at you, depending on how you want to imagine. And you're going to sit right in front of this person. Can you imagine the tension that you would feel? And not only that, you can't be honest with this person. You have to trick this person. So you have to, in front of this person, tell some uh, very tricky tales. And this person is supposedly someone who would know you fairly well, physically, mentally, and somebody uh, who, whose intelligence you respect. 
This is not just Eumaeus that he's lying to. This is not just some uh, Phaeacians he's telling the story to. This is his wife, who is known for being both beautiful, but also circumspect, which means highly intelligent. Recall that Antinous said, no woman in all of Argos has the mind that Penelope has. And, I mean, that includes Helen, who we know to be a very, very sharp uh, blade, um, a way to describe her intellect. Well, let's see what happens here. As her seat is set next to the fire, the servants clean up the goblets and food and ash left over. It's a mess because of those suitors. They don't clean up after themselves. Typical bad zinnia. If you're a guest at a home, I'm sure your parents have said, whenever you're fed, you offer to do what? Clean up and do the dishes. Yes, if you don't cook, you have to offer to do the dishes. It will make people happy to cook for you again, which is a very important thing, especially if they're good cooks. And if you're not, like Mr. Schmidt. In any case, while Odysseus is sitting around there, one of the serving maids shows up. One of the ones that we do not like. Her name is Melantho. And you're like, Melantho? Is that a misspelling of Melanthios? And I say, no, but they are siblings. They are both children of Dolios, who is a servant of Laertes, who we'll actually see a little bit later. But Melanthios and Melantho, apparently, uh, they got more of their mom than their dad in them. And uh, Melantho, she scolds Odysseus. She, Odysseus. She's like, beggar, what are you doing still around here? Trying to get some scraps? Drink? Are you drunk right now? <laughs> Why are you here? And Odysseus, very upset with her. Do you mean to stay here all night? He says, Why do you, why do you judge me so, so poorly? Is it, is it my poor fortune, the fact that I'm a beggar? Is it because I'm so ugly, my poor looks? Why are you so unkind to me? Obviously, your lord, or rather your lady in this case, has ordered me to be here. And you are, in a way, going against her will. It, it is not your place to be scolding me, just like it was not Melanthios' place to scold Eumaeus and to keep a stranger from Odysseus' home. These people are acting like they're the boss when they are servants, and in this time, actually slaves. They are not acting right. There will be a punishment for that sort of thing. In any case, he warns her. He says, perhaps you feel very arrogant now because you're young and you're beautiful. Uh, but I, too, was once young and promising and beautiful. Seems sort of unlikely looking at him in those moments. But he says that, and he says, perhaps someday your mistress and fortune will turn on you. Well, Penelope actually happens to hear this exchange. And she's fairly astonished, and she admonishes Melantho. She says she knows well why the beggar is still there. And uh, just another uh, um, piece of the puzzle to explain why Melantho might be acting like this is uh, Melantho happens to be the lover of Eurymachus. And so perhaps she thinks she has stepped above her station a bit. Perhaps she thinks she'll be married to this lordly man at some point. I'll give you a hint. Neither of them will be alive the day after the next. Um, uh, for slightly different reasons, too. Uh, and they'll have very different deaths. Um, but yes, uh, again, this hubris, this thinking that they have Something that they don't is something that they share. Perhaps that's the root of their attraction. In any case, Penelope then orders your enemy to bring up a chair to Odysseus, and Odysseus and Penelope, like this picture displays, sit across from each other, and the interview begins. I always like this, this old woman in the background. Who do you think that is? A lot of people say Eurycleia. I don't think so. Probably not Eurycleia. Probably somebody who's on this slide. Anybody get it? Old lady servant. Put a chair. Not Melantho, she's young and beautiful. She's old and crone like. Your enemy. Yes, your enemy. And then I always think that this is sort of a sad, sad picture because obviously we've just met which dog who then died. Argos. I know, all too soon he died. Like so many dogs, given their span of life compared to ours. But then there's that dog just sitting right there. And I always think that that's supposed to make us think of Argos. Even though obviously it can't be unless it's a ghost Argos. Um, which perhaps it is, perhaps it is. In any case, the interview is about to begin. You see how pale uh, Penelope is. You see, uh, the, I think Odysseus should actually look older and uglier and dirtier here because he did just have fight after all. Um, but you see how sort of tanned and uh, uh, humble his, his garments are. It's just like a sheet, essentially. It's not very much at all. And, well, let's see what they have to say to each other. Penelope opens. She asks him a series of questions. We recall that this is sort of the root of Odysseus' strength. 
Back in the Iliad, in um, Book 10, during the Dolanea, when he and Diomedes had caught Dolan, recall, right after they caught Dolan and they put him at ease and said, put away your thoughts of death, it was questions that Odysseus asked him. Uh, where is Hector? What are his plans? Where are the contingent forces of the Trojans? Uh, do, they have, um, uh, do, they, do they have sentries posted? Do they have walls around them? Uh, where are they? Is anybody new to the battle? He finds out that the Thracians are. Well, Penelope is also very good at asking questions. You might also think about this. She has become quite used to asking these sorts of questions because many, many, many people have showed up and claimed to have information about Odysseus, so she gets right to the heart of the matter. She says, what man are you and whence? Which means where from, but you will see a lot of people write from whence. It, they don't need to. It's like saying from from where. Um, but yes, what man are you and whence? Where is your city? Your, your parents. And she'll even say, you could not have been born from some fabulous oak or a boulder, the same way that Antinous had done that once. And uh, Odysseus is here immediately going to have to deflect, because if he were going to be honest, he'd say, um, I'm Odysseus. From Ithaca, here. Uh, uh, Ithaca is my city. My parents are uh, Laertes, and anybody remember the name of his mom? Anticlea. Anticlea. Very good. Not Euryclea. Very good. All right. And so Odysseus uh, tries to deflect. He doesn't answer immediately. Is this because he doesn't have a ready-made lie? Is it because it would be very difficult for him to lie to Penelope? Is it because he's nervous to lie to her because perhaps she will see through his lie into who he actually is. All of these thoughts could potentially be occurring to him in this moment. He says, ask me not who I am and where I am from, because it will cause me too much suffering. And so I have here a couple questions. Is he playing with her? Because it, he obviously must tell her. Um, but uh, I think it's just a very complicated situation. In any case, he then subtly prods her about the behavior of her maids and uh, brings up how Melantho has... Uh, treated her, uh, uh, which is, uh, again, something very interesting to mention. He is uh, a slave that is in front of a lady from whom he is receiving hospitality. Who is he to bring up anything, even the smallest criticism of her household? Um, it's almost like it is Odysseus speaking through his character as a beggar here to remind his wife of how, uh, uh, how guests should be treated in her home, even when she doesn't have full power over her home. Uh, in any case, they may accuse him of drunkenness. They accuse him of drunkenness several times, which I think is so interesting because we know what is the attribute of Odysseus that Athena loves him for so much? The fact that he always keeps his head. He's the opposite of somebody who acts drunkenly, like an Elpinor or like the suitors. Um, and yet he gets accused of it so often, which is so funny. In any case, Penelope explains her resourcefulness. And this, this always thing is so interesting. She's sitting down talking to this beggar. He has not yet given her any information. The whole reason, the whole premise behind their conversation is, A, he got sort of mistreated in her house and had to fight against a beggar, and so she felt sort of a need to see him. But also, she heard from Eumaeus that he has information about Odysseus. That's the big reason that they're speaking right now. Uh, he has information to give to her. Why is she telling a story to him? What is she telling him? This is one of those moments where perhaps... If you think Penelope could be seen through the disguise and see that this is Odysseus, where you might find evidence for that perspective. Because she, she says, well, I, I'm no longer pretty. I lost all my looks when Odysseus left. That would be a very clever thing to say to your husband, uh, who has lost his looks, obviously, right in front of you. Because remember, he's an ugly old beggar right now, not his normal uh, taller, thicker, curlier self. And then next... She says, she's had thoughts for no one but Odysseus. Okay, that's something I might say to my husband in disguise. And then she describes, and I find this so odd, her stratagem for keeping the suitors at bay, the weaving of the web for three years, which she would weave during the day. She said it was a shroud for Laertes to keep him comfort at night. She would unweave it at night. Why is she telling this stranger about her strategy for keeping the suitors away from herself? That's the sort of thing I might tell my husband for why I'm still chaste and uh, indicating that I'm so loyal to him and have not cheated on him. Not something I would probably tell to uh, just some random stranger who happens to be a beggar who has information about my husband. And yet she does this. It's very curious. Very curious indeed. In, case, in any case, she says, the only reason that the stratagem eventually failed is that one of my face, faithless Serving women, probably Melantho, though I cannot guarantee that, betrayed her. 
to the suitors, told them that what she was doing, and then they, they have now demanded action on her part. She's got to make a choice. She's either, uh, she's got to choose one of these suitors and leave this home so that Telemachus can become king of this home, or at least ruler of his own house, even if he doesn't become king. Uh, that's something we haven't talked about quite a bit. It is, uh, monarchy at this time is not quite as set in stone as in, like, say, the Middle Ages, uh, thinking about France, Germany, and Italy. Um, it's mostly whoever is most powerful and most wealthy in a land is the king of that land, and that has happened to be Odysseus, but his, uh, his wealth has been depleted quite a bit by the suitors, and so whether his son would be king after him is uh, highly suspect, is something uh, questionable. In any case, so now she's had to finish making this shroud from Laertes. The suitors are demanding a decision from her, especially because Telemachus is grown. And then so she asks again about Odysseus. She's like, okay, well, I happen to have given you a bunch of information, but the whole reason we're here is, uh, who are you? And uh, uh, you were not born from any fabulous oaks or boulder. You must have a story. You must be a person. You must have a name. And so Odysseus begins his great lie. And... It is very similar to the lie that he told to Eumaeus. He claims to be from Crete. He claims to be the grandson of the first king of Crete, Minos, father of the Minotaur and brother to Radamanthus, great Minos who we will see down in the inferno next year, judging the dead, uh, wrapping his, his snake-like tail around a stone to indicate which circle of the inferno that they go to. Minos is commonly considered a great judge, he was also the son of Zeus. And so Odysseus claims that his grandfather was Minos. And that his brother was Idomeneus. Remember Idomeneus who had Marianes, who was such a nasty piece of work in the Iliad. He was the guy who liked to stab people and watch them scream as they died. Uh, uh, well, yes. And remember also, sadly, Idomeneus was also the man who uh, made a promise to Poseidon that he would sacrifice the first living thing he saw upon returning to Crete to Poseidon. That happened to be his son. And he kept that promise. And then Crete had a terrible plague because of that. Hurt family members, murder family members, often plague will come to you. Do something especially appropriate to the gods, plague comes to you. Recall plague coming at the beginning of the Iliad. We'll actually see a very famous plague in um, the first play we read uh, in the next few weeks, actually, um, in Oedipus Tyrannus. The, the uh, conceit of the play, uh, the uh, precipitating event, rather, will be that there is a plague, and somebody needs to do something about it. And it will be Oedipus. And, uh, well, yep. In any case, he says, Idomeneus was my brother, Ithon. Ethon is my name. Interesting thing about what Ithon means, it means blazing or shining. Almost like it's obvious who Odysseus actually is, regardless of who he says he is. And now he starts to give the information. And recall, this is all lie. And he's telling it to Penelope. And she's heard many lies before. And she ostensibly should know something about her husband, but it's been 20 years and she doesn't think he's alive. So does she suspect that this man could be her husband or not? Again, we're confused. We're, in it. we're staying perplexed. We're in a, we are in a moment of perplexion. Perplexity, excuse me. Once he says, uh, I was entertaining. I entertained Odysseus uh, in Crete. He was on the way to Ilion, to Troy. And Idomeneus had already left, so it was my responsibility to extend Zinnia to this traveler. He knew how to say many false things that were like true things. I love that quote. It's like he's, it's like he's tantalizing her. It's like he's tempting her to see him for what he really is. He knew how to say many false things that were like true saints. That's precisely what he's doing in this very moment. And so... Uh, <laughs> Penelope then breaks down into tears. And I always wonder whether that is the perfect response. She breaks into tears because that's such an honest thing to say about Odysseus. This man seems to have actually seen Odysseus. She remembers, yes, he could tell stories. Or, if you think that she thinks that this is Odysseus, that is a very clever thing for her to do, too. To, as a teacher, I can tell you that one of the most effective strategies for getting me to give somebody extra time is to show up in front of me and to beg in tears that I give extra time. It's happened many times in my career, and sometimes I actually grant it. And In fact, I've had uh, generally ladies uh, tell me after they were my students, it's the best strategy possible. Uh, teachers, they always give in to it, and I think, that's so funny. You actually use that as a strategy? That is so duplicitous. And that is very, very effective. Oh, Mr. Schmidt, I was good at the work. 
but then the internet and life is bad in town. I'm like, okay, just calm down. Okay, you can have five minutes, or you can have a day or something. I wonder if that's what Penelope is doing here. When she breaks down into tears, if Odysseus is her husband, and he has some affection for her, what is he going to be tempted to do? He's going to be tempted to give up his disguise and comfort her. And yet again, he has to show this endurance. He's watching his wife, who he loves, cry right in front of him, just like when he saw Argos, his dog, right in front of him, and he wanted to comfort him before he died. And can he? No, because he's got a strategy, and he's got to stick to the tactics he put in place. Is she testing him? He wants to comfort her, but he must deny himself. <sighs> Yet another test. And so then Penelope continues to test the truth of Odysseus' story. She recovers from her tears. She asks several other good questions. What was he wearing? Excellent question. Looking for details like that. If he's just making up this story, how could he possibly know what Odysseus was wearing, especially if she gave him something special to wear? What sort of man was he? Well, he started answered that, answering that to some extent. But then, also, who followed him? Who was with him? Do you know their names as well? This is a fantastic way to expose somebody's lie. Ask for details. Don't tell them they're a liar. Just ask for additional details. Oh, you saw this person. What were they wearing? That night, who was with them? These are excellent uh, orienting questions. In any case, let's see if Odysseus has an answer. He, he probably will, because he is Odysseus, so he should know what he was wearing. But it's been quite a bit of time, so maybe he's forgotten. He responds brilliantly, as you would expect. It's been a long time since I've seen Odysseus, he says. And, you know, it's been about 20 years since before Odysseus went to Ileon. But... But I seem to recall he had a purple mantle on. That means a purple cloak. Very regal. Very beautiful color in ancient Greek. Um, and, in fact, you can watch videos on how they used to produce the color purple. And he had this golden pin. Remember, the pin is what holds the two parts of a cloak together. It's like a clasp. And it's a very interesting pin. It's very remarkable. You would not forget it if you saw it. It has a hound holding down a fawn. That's a baby deer. Uh, and so it's, it's, that is itself a symbol for what Odysseus is, right? The hunter catching the prey. Um, uh, the, yeah, well, and yeah, the hunter catching the prey, I think, is exactly right. And he said, I, I love this, I love this too. He, he says, many of the women were, it says looting here, it should say looking at his tunic in admiration. He adds in the, the moment that he was so well dressed that the ladies like how he was dressed, that the ladies like how Odysseus looked. Ladies like Odysseus is what he's saying. And Penelope perhaps caused a little bit of jealousy or envy in her heart. He says, but that's only what I saw him in. He could have changed clothes from the time he left Ithaca to that time. But that's what I saw him in. And, well, you know, you don't see a lot of pins of hounds holding fawns down uh, these days or those. And so uh, this starts to add credence to his story. He, he then says he had a herald with him. Euripides, oh Euripides, throwback all the way to the first book of the Iliad. Remember, Talthybius and Euripides were sent to take um, Briseis from Achilleus. And remember, they were shivering and they thought he was going to kill them. And then he was nice to them and he was like, I'm not angry at you, I'm angry at Agamemnon, go ahead and take this lady. Um, and then all the events of the Iliad transpired. In any case, he's answered her questions very well. This is what he was wearing. This is a person that he was with. I know what I'm talking about. What happens? Penelope cries again. <laughs> Penelope cries and welcomes the stranger the entire time. Odysseus is probably thinking, gosh, how am I putting her through so much? Uh, one interesting note is that Odysseus will run into his father soon, and his father will be so pathetic that he can't even bear to maintain the lie. He'll start lying to him, and then his dad will start to cry, and that's just too much for him. So he can, he can watch his wife cry a couple times, but his dad crying, it's just too pathetic, and what is it? Uh, I forget which movie it is. I think it's a Disney movie. It's a funny movie, but uh, uh, the quote is, is there anything sadder than watching an old man cry? At least for Odysseus, the answer is no. Uh, <clears throat> well, Penelope cries and welcomes the stranger, and even though he claims to have information on Odysseus, she says, well, there's no way that Odysseus will return. Uh, Odysseus then claims, well, he was in Thesprosia, which is fairly close to Ithaca, closer than mainland Argos, and he is here now. Because Phaedon, their king, told me, or him in this case. And still Penelope will not believe. 
oh, you heard from some guy that he was there and is now here. I've heard from some guy that he was there and is now here many, many times over the last ten years or so. Um, and uh, that's just not, that doesn't give me a lot of assurance that he's really, really here. Uh, so the story starts to sound a little bit more like every story that she's heard. Uh, well, um, that's sort of where it ends for this moment. She's, she's very pleased that this man came and knew some things about Odysseus. And even though it caused her some sorrow, she appreciates uh, the fact that he's come so far to tell her what he has. And so uh, he requests a bath. But he requests, and this is a very interesting request, because I'm not sure uh, what he's thinking exactly. He requests an old lady. Well, when we hear an old lady is going to bathe him, who's it probably going to be who bathes him? Who's the only old lady we know? Eurycleia. Now, it's sort of interesting. Eurycleia can bathe him, and Penelope is going to be very close to them when uh, they're being bathed. She's going to be in the room over. She can hear what's happening, essentially. So I want you to keep that in mind during this intimate scene. And again, a scene of bathing. And again, a scene of a woman bathing a man. Recall we heard about Helen bathing Odysseus. We've seen Odysseus bathe himself and refuse the nymph-like servants of Nausicaa. But now he asks for an old woman. And the reason he says is so that she won't make fun of him. He says, you're only serving women. They make fun of me. But here's something weird. Odysseus has a very, very distinguishing mark on him. If he pulls up his tunic a little, or rather his uh, sort of rags at this point, he's got a very demarcated scar on his knee. Sort of like if you've read Harry Potter, Albus Dumbledore has a scar on his knee that's supposedly a map to the London Underground. Why wouldn't he, if he didn't want to expose himself, ask for a younger serving woman to bathe him? They would not remember the scar because they would be too young to. However, Eurycleia was his nurse. She knows him very well. She would definitely remember the scar on his knee. And yet, it is not clear that he thinks about this because he tries to hide the scar from her. And yet, this will be a misstep on Odysseus's part. Eurycleia, then, oh, I love this. This is a very emotional part. Now, and again, really tests our imagination. We're still wondering, to some extent, whether Penelope or anybody can recognize Odysseus. Well, when Eurycleia sees Ithon, he looks so pathetic that she bursts into tears because he's the same age as her master Odysseus would be. And he even, he even looks like Odysseus. She says, you look as tragic and pathetic and similar to my lord if he were still around. And Odysseus, I think, has the most brilliant response. He says, that's what everybody says. Everybody tells me that I look like Odysseus. And so it's like, can she th see through the disguise? And if Eurycleia can see through the disguise, can Penelope, who knows Odysseus perhaps even better than she, but I suppose uh, she might not know Odysseus as well as Eurycleia. Eurycleia has known Odysseus his entire life. Penelope, uh, she was won by Odysseus in a foot race um, after the choosing of Helen by Menelaus, and then they, uh, you know, they got married, they had a child, but then very soon after that, Odysseus had to leave for Troy. Perhaps, uh, perhaps she does not have the strongest memory of him. Hmm. And then, as I told you, he tries to hide the scar on his knee. Eurycleia here, <coughs> wiping him down, foot base in there. Now, Eurycleia, and this is, a, this is a very interesting narrative technique. This is, a, this is putting an impasse in the action. She sees the scar. We expect her to freak out. We expect a giant reaction. And then, boom, flashback. We have to pause. Uh, and instead of getting what it is we want to see immediately, we now have, uh, we now have uh, uh, to endure sort of a sub-story. Oh, no. Are we running out of time? In any case, we'll have to finish this story later. And it is the story of how Odysseus received his name as well as this scar.